I see the Zoom room is starting to fill up. Welcome in to another edition of the virtual speaker series. We'll be getting started in just a minute. Closed captioning is available for this session. You can find instructions for closed captioning uh, in the chat box. Today, we're going to talk with Don Wagner. He's going to talk about the deer pens at Penn State and the Deer Research Center in the Department of Animal Sciences here at Penn State University. And we look forward to sharing their story in just a couple of minutes. Tell us who you are and where you're Zooming in from. You can use the chat box to do that here in Zoom, or you could go right ahead and put that in the comments on Facebook Live for the audience out on Facebook that's watching us. We'll be getting started in just a minute. Thanks for tuning in to the virtual speaker session. I see Jan in Westchester. I see Tanya in Springfield, Virginia. Stephanie, class of 2012, listening from Boston. John Hess down in Westchester. Vicki in Harrisburg. Jenny Schaefer in Spring Grove, Pennsylvania. Welcome in. John, appreciate your comments about Football Letter Live. We had a fun season with that. Hopefully you saw the email that went out yesterday with the special bonus edition embedded in that email with a interview of John Black. Football Letter Live was our in-season football program hosted by the Alumni Association. You can find those archives on our YouTube page or on our uh, archived events page at alumni.psu.edu slash events. We'll be getting started here in just one minute. I see Scott Thatcher from Great Valley, the, the parking lot at Great Valley. Scott, thanks for tuning in. And I see Bill in Harwich, Massachusetts, and Alan in Denver, Pennsylvania, Tracy from Altoona, Bill Schaefer down in Winbur. Marsha tuning in. Good morning, Marsha in Los Angeles, California. I see Diane right here in Pennsylvania. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. And I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom video window and then clicking on show subtitle. You may also customize your caption view by clicking the stream text link posted in the chat. Today, we welcome Don Wagner, who has been the manager of the Deer Research Center in the Department of Animal Science at Penn State for 20 years. His daily work consists of animal care, coordinating and conducting research, and providing educational experiences to students and the public. A 1997 graduate of Penn State, Don received a bachelor's degree in wildlife and fisheries sciences and was a member of the Penn State Blue Band. Many alumni remember the deer pens as a popular spot to visit during their time at Penn State. At one time, the facility ranked only behind the Lion Shrine, Beaver Stadium, and Berkey Creamery in the number of annual visitors. While public access to the facility is restricted, was restricted in the early 2000s to protect the health of the animals, research and educational programs continue at the center. Don Wagner uh, will discuss animal care throughout the year, uh, give you an overview of past and current research and talk about the students involvement at the facility. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Don. Don, thanks for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. So uh, today I'm going to give you a, a kind of a, a virtual tour of the, the Penn State Deer Research Center. Uh, you know, normally uh, we can do these in person and, and you can come up through and, and actually see the live animals, but uh, I'm going to try to give you the best uh, opportunity we can here to see some of the animals that we have and, and talk about the facility. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. I'm going to share my screen.
Okay, so uh, for anyone who hasn't uh, visited the facility before, uh, we're located uh, about a mile from campus here at, at University Park. And uh, we have a, a 23 acre high fence facility where we have a captive herd of, of white-tailed deer that we can use for research. And uh, the facility is, is broken down into nine different pens so we can bring the animals in uh, and, and split them into different uh, breeding herds, different research herds, and, and basically move things around and set things up uh, as, as any type of a study that we're working on would dictate. Uh, so this is just a, uh, a picture of the, the driveway as you approach a facility. Uh, the, the yellow building there straight ahead is a handling barn. Um, I'll show you a picture of that here in a minute. But uh, this is uh, just a, a shot of one of the outdoor pens that we have. Uh, the, the paddocks range in size from about a quarter of an acre up to some of the larger ones are three to, to four, four and a half acres. Uh, we also have a, a display room right in the center of the facility. And this, uh, this room can be used for uh, when we're able to uh, host tours. Uh, we have classes that come out and uh, we also run some labs at the, the facility that we'll talk to talk about a little bit later here. And then this is a, a picture inside the handling barn and that would be in that yellow building up there on your the top left. And within this pen uh, or within this building, we have 24 individual pens. Uh, they're about uh, 24 feet by 10 foot in size that we can bring animals in if we have animals that uh, need extra medical care. If anyone happened to get sick or injured, we can bring them in. Uh, some research projects that we do require animals to be housed inside for a little while. Uh, and we can do all of that within the, the barn here. Uh, we also handle all of our animals once a year or uh, most of them twice a year for uh, vaccinations. Uh, again, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later, but this is the, the area where we do that. And of course, the most important uh, feature of our facility is the herd of white-tailed deer that we have. Uh, typically, we maintain a herd between 60 to 100 animals. Uh, I believe right now we have uh, right around 70 animals. And uh, we have animals in, in all stages of life, uh, from the spring's fawn crop up to uh, some of the more mature animals that are uh, uh, anywhere from, I think some of the older ones right now are around 12 to 13 years old. Uh, and, and that's typically the, the lifespan of a deer in the wild, but in captivity, uh, they can live a little bit longer. Uh, we, uh, we've had those here up to 20 years old. Uh, so they, uh, you know, they can, can live out a pretty long life there uh, in captivity. So today I want to talk to you about some of the, the research trials that we run at the facility and then also some of the, uh, uh, basically the life cycle of the deer throughout the year. Uh, you know, some people may be very familiar with it, others, uh, you know, might not quite understand the, the yearly cycle that these animals go through. And uh, to get started here, we'll just look at some of the, the early work that was done. And this is actually the, the third deer research facility that Penn State has had. Uh, back uh, in the 1920s and 1950s and 1960s, a lot of the early research focused on um, the nutritional value of plants uh, and, and the nutrition requirements of white-tailed deer. Uh, basically, what did it take to grow a nice, healthy white-tailed deer in the wild? Uh, what type of plants were good for them? Uh, what type of plants uh, may be toxic to them? And, and basically, the, the research was just was done to basically establish the, the baseline diet for a, a healthy white-tailed deer. And uh, this is just a chart here in the bottom just to show how much they consume, uh, how much vegetation they consume on a daily basis throughout the year. And it really fluctuates. Uh, you know, people ask how much does a deer eat? It can range from less than two pounds of food a day in the winter up to over six pounds a day in the fall of the year as the, the bucks are getting ready for the breeding season. But uh, it really fluctuates throughout the year. And, and a lot of that early research really focused on that, uh, looking at protein levels in the diet, um, mineral levels to grow nice big antlers on the bucks and uh, you know, different things like that. 
So we'll, we'll talk a little bit here about the, the antler cycle in the bucks. Uh, a, a lot of people don't uh, understand how the, the cycle happens that they, they actually grow a new set of antlers every year. So whenever you look at a, a buck, it uh, doesn't matter how big those antlers are, uh, those, those antlers grew in a, a short amount of time frame, uh, usually about four months. So to go through that cycle, this is a, uh, a picture of a two-year-old buck that we had at the facility. And this picture was taken the first week of May. And you can see the antlers are starting to grow there. Uh, they're, they're covered in velvet. Uh, it's just a, basically a skin that's covered with real short hair. Uh, it's, it's, they're kind of warm to the touch. There's a lot of blood flow into the antlers. Um, and, and there's also uh, a lot of nerves in the antlers so that the bucks can actually feel where those antlers are on their head. Uh, this is the same deer the first week of uh, June. And again, the same deer the first week of July. So you can see from the picture to the top left to the top right, uh, that was only two months of, of antler growth. Uh, antlers are the fastest growing tissue known in the animal kingdom. Um, in whitetails, they can grow up to about a quarter of an inch a day. So I can uh, you know, look at these animals on a, a Monday, on a Wednesday or Thursday of the same week, you can actually see the, the antler growth uh, from, from day to day. It's, it's kind of cool uh, that time of year. And then when we get into August, uh, the antlers are, are just about fully grown. This is the same deer uh, as, as in the previous pictures now in the first week of August. At this point of the, the antler growth, the, the antlers are just about done growing in size. They're not gonna get much bigger, but what's happening now, the antlers are starting to mineralize and harden. Uh, as the antlers were growing, uh, they were kind of soft and almost felt a little pliable. And it, uh, it, it's basically like cartilage. Uh, the, the, the antlers are kind of porous in there. They're, you know, they're, they're not real solid. But once we get into August, the bucks start to mineralize and harden those antlers, and then they'll begin to turn into to true bone. And one thing that's interesting and that they found from early research, uh, during this time frame when the bucks are actually uh, hardening those antlers, they cannot consume enough minerals in their diet to, to put up into the antlers. So they'll take minerals that are stored in their body, uh, particularly in their ribs, and then transport them up into the, the antlers. So uh, you know, a lot of people wanna put mineral blocks out or supplement feed or things like that, you know, trying to grow big antlers uh, when, when the bucks are actually growing their antlers. But, but you really have to look at, at antler growth as a, a complete yearly cycle. I mean, they're, they're, they're preparing for that antler growth period uh, all through the winter and the spring, uh, you know, basically getting set up to grow those antlers uh, so that, that the proper nutrients and minerals are there when they need them. Then uh, once we get into August, the, the antlers are, or uh, excuse me, September, the antlers are, are hardened. The velvet starts to dry up. Uh, all the nerve endings that were in there dry up and the, the, the velvet is peeled off of the antlers. And in this picture, this is actually a different deer. Uh, they look very similar, but the one on the left is the father and the one on the right is the, the son. It's, it's still a two-year-old deer, uh, the same age. Uh, so you can see the, the antler characteristics are you know, passed on pretty similar. Another thing that's interesting with this picture, when you look at the, the buck there on the right, uh, his legs are uh, a reddish orangish hair coat. Uh, so that's the summer hair coat. And then across his back, he's transitioning into the winter hair coat. And I get a lot of uh, pictures uh, people send me from uh, trail cameras this time of year, wanting to know what, what's wrong with the, the skin condition or what's wrong with this, this deer. Uh, and, and basically they're just going through the natural transition from the, the, winter, uh, from the summer hair coat into the winter hair coat. Uh, and they can almost look bald across their back at, at times uh, you know, certain times there in, in late August and early September. Now we're back to the uh, original deer here. Uh, this is the, the two-year-old buck again uh, in the first week of October. And now you can see he has a full winter hair coat. Antlers are in, uh, you know, the hard antler, the true bone. 
uh, neck muscles are starting to, to build up there, getting ready for the, the breeding season. And one thing that we do in the fall of the year is uh, we, we vaccinate all of our deer. So every animal in the facility is, is either brought into the handling barn or in this case, in, in this picture, uh, we dart them out in the, the paddock and uh, we'll sedate them. Once they're under sedation, then we can safely work on them. Uh, we'll give them their vaccinations. And then if, uh, if we have time, we'll, we'll take some antler measurements if it's a buck, uh, you know, go over and do a, a good health examination on, on all the animals that we have sedated, uh, you know, check out their feet. Uh, look for any issues like that. And, uh, you know, this picture here is just showing a, a few of the students working on the, the buck. Uh, we do hire students at the facility to help with everything that goes on from the, uh, the animal care to the research projects to any educational events that we do. Uh, the students are, are involved in all of that. Uh, you know, it gives them uh, a good experience uh, in addition to their, their class studies. So once we get done with the, the fall vaccinations, uh, we move the animals into the breeding herds for that particular year. And the, the peak of the, the breeding season in Pennsylvania uh, and in our facility, uh, the deer in our facility, the, the behavior is very similar to what they are in the wild. Uh, the, the timing is, is all pretty much exactly the same. And uh, most of the deer are, uh, most of the does will come into estrus uh, right around the middle of November. Uh, so anywhere from the, the somewhere around the 12th of November up to the 18th of November is, is usually the peak of the breeding season. Uh, so we'll have all the breeding herds established at that point and we'll turn the bucks in. Uh, most of the, the breeding is done naturally at the facility. Uh, we do a little bit of artificial insemination. I'll talk about that later. But uh, some of the characteristics that we look for uh, when we're setting up the breeding herds uh, because we, we handle the animals so much for different projects, uh, the students are involved uh, with working with the animals. We want to have animals that are calm and easier to work with. So that's a, a major characteristic that we, we try to breed for. And then of course, uh, you know, everybody likes to, to come here and see the, the big bucks. Uh, so antler growth is something that we, we do factor in a little bit, but uh, body size is also something that we, we look at. Uh, typically the bigger animals are a little calmer uh, but that also, uh, a lot of those, uh, the bigger bucks also have bigger antlers. So uh, that all kind of works out pretty nicely. So we, we occasionally do some artificial insemination. And this is basically done for two, two reasons. Uh, first, we operate as a closed herd. So we don't want to bring... Uh, live animals into our facility that could potentially have disease and expose our animals to other diseases that, that are currently not in the facility. So uh, being a closed herd, you have to be really careful with the genetics. You don't want to uh, have animals inbred and, and all that. So every few years, we'll, we'll do some artificial insemination to a few animals. And that's a way of getting different genetics into the herd. But it also is a, a really good opportunity for the students to get involved. Uh, we hire a lot of students uh, in uh, animal science, uh, veterinary biomedical science, wildlife and fishery science, uh, some biology, uh, you know, occasionally some forestry, but uh, you know, particularly the ones in animal science and veterinary biomedical science, uh, you know, eventually in their career, they may want to work in zoos or with livestock and, and artificial insemination is a process that they might uh, run into quite a bit. So uh, this gives them some early exposure and some, some hands-on uh, work with it. So once our deer are uh, bred either naturally or, or via artificial insemination, uh, then we get into the winter months, uh, the testosterone level in the buck starts to drop off and then the antlers are cast. And uh, that's just a, a few pictures here. The, the buck on the left, uh, it dropped that antler earlier in the morning uh, the one up there on the top right, that was just a, a fresh uh, shed probably about five minutes before I uh, took that picture. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't really look painful. They, you know, the antler just kind of pop off. They shake their head a little bit and within a few minutes they're back eating and, and don't really, uh, it doesn't bother them. And then uh, 
you know, we get into the spring of the year. Of course, that's when the fawns are born. Uh, the last two weeks of May, the first two weeks of June uh, is typically the peak in, in Pennsylvania. And then uh, the whole antler growth starts over again. So, you know, that's kind of a, the, the yearly cycle of, of how we deal with the animals here. So we'll get into a little more of the, the, re the research that we do here. Uh, this was a project that I was involved with as a student. Uh, it's, it's not a popular topic among hunters. Uh, you know, I'll say that right up front. We, uh, we had a lot of uh, hate mail from hunters about that. But uh, you know, the group that we uh, worked with on this immunocontraceptive or, or contraceptive project with was the uh, USDA, uh, specifically the, the National Wildlife Research Center out in Fort Collins, Colorado. And for this project, uh, they were looking at ways to control deer populations in urban areas where the, the deer can't uh, be safely hunted. Uh, also, they were looking at uh, military installations, uh, airports, uh, different federal facilities that are high fence that deer populations get into and, and you know, they, they can't safely hunt them. So, it wasn't a case where we were doing research to control all of the deer in the United States with contraceptives. Uh, it was just basically adding a tool to the toolbox of, of deer managers in uh, you know, different settings as a way to uh, you know, kind of keep populations in check where the hunting uh, wasn't feasible or, or wasn't really possible. Uh, in most situations, uh, hunting you know, is effective. Uh, in most situations, you can go in and do controlled archery hunts uh, there's lots of programs out there that, uh, you know, work really well. But, uh, you know, we were working with uh, the USDA on basically developing this other tool. So uh, some of the problems that you can get into whenever um, you have high deer populations are just very poor nutrition and, and disease in the animals. Uh, you know, the picture there on the left, uh, that picture was taken in an area of the state uh, down around uh, near Philadelphia um, that had a deer herd density of around 240 deer per square mile. Uh, and the same with the picture there on the right, uh, you know, where the doe's standing, it looks like a nice green vegetation underneath, but uh, it's basically an invasive plant that's not good for the deer to eat. So they, uh, you know, they basically eat themselves out of house and home, the health deteriorates and you have a very unhealthy deer population if you don't control them in some way. Um, and then, of course, we also, uh, you know, you have the issue of deer vehicle collisions uh, when you have uh, very high deer densities in, in these suburban areas. And the way these, the populations can, can really explode in a hurry, the does will typically have uh, twin fawns each year. So when a, when a doe is one year old, she's capable of producing a, a fawn, and, and that's usually a single fawn. By the time she's two years old and has a fawn, uh, usually it's about 50-50. Sometimes they'll have a single, sometimes they'll have twins. But a mature doe from somewhere around the age of two to three up to, uh, and, and they can have fawns throughout their whole life. Uh, we've had does have twins up to 13, 14 years old. Uh, so, you know, every year they're turning out two, two fawns. And if you don't have any way to control that, that population, uh, starvation's the, you know, what uh, ultimately does it. Uh, they'll just eat themselves out of house and home and, uh, and that'll be it. So uh, it's really important to have ways to control the, the populations uh, for the safety and, you know, the, the health of all the animals in the herd. So for this project, uh, and, and this is, uh, you know, this kind of really highlights uh, the advantage of having a, a captive herd to do the, the work with. Uh, you know, you can try different contraceptive drugs out in the wild. Uh, you can go out and sedate an animal and come back in, in uh, the next year and see if they have fawns. But you really don't know what's going on in between. Uh, so for this particular project, we, uh, we tested out a number of different vaccines uh, over the course of 20 years. Uh, each year we would try a few different uh, things. And basically we would vaccinate the animals uh, prior to breeding season. We would turn the does out uh, with a buck. Uh, we would have students out there uh, doing observations to, to look at if there's any behavioral changes associated with, with different treatments. Uh, we would bring the animals in uh, a few times a year to collect blood samples to see if the vaccines were actually working. 
uh, looking at antibody titers. Uh, we would ultrasound the deer in the winter to look and see if the deer were pregnant in the winter and then correlate that with the data of, uh, you know, out there in the pens in the spring, whether or not the does had fawns. So it was really, uh, really an interesting project to work on, uh, you know, kind of the complete package there. We knew what was going on at, at all points. And, uh, you know, it was really, really an interesting project. And in 2010, uh, the USDA uh, did get a drug approved uh, through the EPA. Uh, the drug was called uh, Gonacon, and it was uh, approved for use in, in white-tailed deer. And of course, this is one of the, the main ones that we had tested and, and worked on for a number of years. Um, you know, the does were very healthy on it. It basically just shut down the, the reproductive cycle, uh, so they did not commend asterisks. Uh, one shot was effective for about four years. Uh, about 80% effective up to four years. So you could treat one deer uh, and, and the doe would not get pregnant for about uh, four to five years. And uh, it has to be used on does only and mature does only. It, it does have some negative effects on the antler growth of bucks. Uh, so they wanna make sure that uh, button bucks aren't accidentally uh, treated. Uh, you do have to physically capture the animal and inject them uh, by hand. Uh, that was one of the stipulations with uh, that particular drug. So it, it does, uh, you know, it's, it's not a, a feasible for large scale, but in certain areas, it's, uh, you know, it's certainly a, an option. Uh, since then, uh, I believe some work has been done, uh, not here, but uh, in other areas uh, with this particular drug with uh, wild hogs and uh, also uh, wild horses or uh, feral hogs and wild horses. So, uh, you know, there's some other potential uses to the, to the drug. So after the contraceptive work, uh, we got into some smaller projects looking at uh, how deer affect the habitat. Uh, you know, we, we know deer can eat a tremendous amount of vegetation and can really destroy habitat if, if the herds are left unchecked. Uh, this is a, a couple of pictures uh, that I took in north central Pennsylvania, uh, an area where I uh, go to a hunting camp. And this is basically on the same ridge. Uh, these pictures were taken about a half mile apart. Uh, the one on the left, there's no fence around it. Uh, the one on the right there, there's a, a five wire uh, electric deer fence that uh, this was actually developed uh, by Penn State years ago. But uh, basically what this shows, uh, the, the picture on the right there, they went in and did a, a, some type of a timber harvest and then fenced the area off so that the deer could not get in there or, or not many deer get in there. And this allows the, the forest to regenerate. Uh, so you'll see this, you know, this flush of new growth there uh, as opposed to on the left where the, the deer have free range to, to just basically go in and devour everything that, uh, that tries to grow in that area. Uh, so there, there's a lot of different factors uh, that can affect uh, you know, the vegetation, but deer are, are certainly one of them. So, we, uh, one of the studies uh, looked at, uh, what they were specifically looking at was invasive and, and uh, non-native plants to Pennsylvania, looking at the, uh, the palatability of, of them. So they would, uh, the, the grad students would go out, collect different types of vegetation, uh, different species, bring them in, put them in, place them in different buckets. Uh, they would weigh out the, the vegetation uh, to see how much was there and then turn deer in. Uh, we would turn pairs of deer in so that uh, the animals would feel comfortable. Uh, you know, we weren't turning single animals in. Uh, they would, uh, you know, have another friend there basically that uh, would, would keep them calm and they would investigate these different uh, plants and, you know, eat the ones they liked and, and let the ones alone that they didn't like. And uh, we've done several studies like that since uh, looking at various things. But uh, the main one was this, the top right picture there and the, the bottom left picture. Uh, that's the same setup. So you can kind of see what, uh, you know, how much they, they eat in the course of a, an evening, basically. Uh, the animals were left in for about 24 hours. And then the next day, the whole, the whole setup would be switched around. Uh, we'd bring new plants in, move different deer in. And uh, you just replicate this over and over. And, you know, after a, a few series of trials, then you have some, some really good data as far as what the, the deer like. So this brings us to uh, a project that we're wrapping up right now. Uh, and it's a, a project involving chronic wasting disease. Um, 
I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about chronic wasting disease. That's a, a whole other topic. But basically, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, a neurological disease that white-tailed deer get. Um, it's transmitted by, we know, nose-to-nose -nose contact. There's, there's probably other ways. Uh, there can be environmental contamination. Uh, the disease was discovered back in the, the 1960s in Colorado. Uh, in the last few decades, it's really expanded and, and spread across the U.S. Uh, I believe now it's somewhere in 23 or 25 different states. Uh, and unfortunately, it's about uh, the disease management area is about 10 miles from our facility. Uh, so it is in Pennsylvania, it's getting closer to where we're located at here near University Park. So knowing this, you know, disease is, is basically marching up to our doorstep. Um, one thing that we were concerned about was wild deer coming in contact with captive deer in our pens. Uh, and so we put a grant in with the uh, Department of Agriculture in Pennsylvania, and they, uh, they manage the, the captive deer farms in Pennsylvania and have regulatory authority over the, them. So uh, they were interested in different fence designs. Uh, we were interested in different fence designs, what would work. So um, we basically uh, you know, wanted to try to minimize contact between wild deer and captive deer at the, the captive deer fence line. Uh, and, and this works both ways. If there's a, a captive deer that has chronic wasting disease, we don't want to spread it out into the wild. If a wild deer walks up to the fence that has the disease, we don't want to bring it into the facility. So we tested out uh, several different fence designs. Uh, this is just one of them, uh, a six wire fence, uh, five feet high. And basically we, we constructed different types of fence within our facility. Uh, we set up surveillance cameras uh, so we could monitor all the behavior. And then we would turn different animals in uh, on different sides of the fence so that we could, could look in, at the different behaviors and, and see if, if any of the deer were able to get through the, the fence to have nose-to-nose -nose contact uh, that, you know, in the wild could potentially transmit disease. So we, uh, these are just a few of the, the bucks that we used. We, we tried to simulate deer that you would typically see in Pennsylvania, uh, some wild deer, uh, the sizes of bucks that would be out there in the wild coming into uh, a captive facility. So basically, uh, you know, we would put these animals on one side of the fence, we would have uh, some does that were in estrus or a buck that was a little bit bigger that they wanted to fight on the other side of the fence, and just provided different stimulus for them to want to get through and, and then uh, you know, just basically looked and, and to see what what designs were effective and which ones weren't. Uh, this is a, a shot of just a, a few of the animals up at the fence. Uh, the light's hitting it there nice so you can see how it's actually set up. But it basically, it, it just provides a physical barrier between the two animals so they don't have the nose-to-nose -nose contact. And we're in the, in the process of uh, getting a, a publication uh, submitted for uh, review. So uh, hopefully within the near future, the results of this study will, will be out. One thing that was, that was really interesting uh, through the, the course of the, the study, uh, we had a lot of cameras aimed outside the facility. So we were able to see what was around the, the outside. And you know we're only located about a mile from the main campus here. And the amount of wildlife that we had around was, uh, was pretty interesting. Uh, we had some bears that, that visited on a number of occasions. Uh, it was a, a mother with three cubs up there on the top. Uh, coyotes, just about every night over the winter, uh, coyotes were around somewhere. Uh, we don't have problems with them coming into the pens, but you know they're out there. And then uh, the picture there on the bottom, there's uh, two wild bucks fighting on the outside, and then that's our captive deer there on the, the inside. But uh, we still, we did have some wild deer come up to the fence on the outside. Uh, so we're, we want to review some data there, but uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't have a lot. So this uh, kind of brings us to the, the final um, trial that we're, we're getting ready to work on. Uh, you know, when we have tours here, a lot of people say, why why aren't you guys working on ticks or tick control? You know, it's a, it's a big disease in Pennsylvania and in the Northeast. So uh, 
about a year ago, I was approached by a private company to, uh, to do some work on tick control. And uh, we're in the very preliminary stages. Uh, well, we have the, the experimental design and everything done. Uh, and uh, we're getting ready to do some work in the spring. Um, and I can't get into a whole lot of detail just because of we're, we're still in the early stages. But uh, we do want to test some products that, that may, be able, uh, may be effective in controlling adult ticks that would uh, attach themselves to white-tailed deer. Uh, white-tailed deer are a, a major host to a, adult ticks of uh, several different species of ticks that, that uh, you know, can carry the, the Lyme disease and, and other diseases. So if, uh, you know, if we can come up with uh, some effective way of killing adult ticks that, that attach themselves to white-tailed deer, uh, that could go a long way to, to control tick populations in some of these areas that, that do have uh, you know, high prevalence of Lyme disease and, and high deer densities. Uh, so that's a few years off, but uh, you know, we are starting to, to work on it. We do a, a lot of educational um, things at the facility. We're not open to the public like we used to be where you could walk up around the outside of the fence uh, and that's due to disease uh, concerns. Uh, but we are uh, still functioning where we bring college uh, classes out. Uh, we'll bring uh, school class groups out, 4-H uh, groups, things like that. So we can offer tours. Uh, this is just a, a picture here of, of one of the labs that we offer uh, pretty much on a routine basis for some of our, our wildlife students here at Penn State. Uh, Basically, they get to come in and, and have the opportunity to go over how we sedate and how we properly handle and, and, and care for uh, wild animals that are under sedation. And for this particular lab, uh, we give uh, some lectures about sedating animals and handling animals. And then uh, they come out to the facility. We basically dart an animal. They have the chance to, to try out different types of dart projectors. And then they can, uh, they have the opportunity to help with vaccinations. Uh, so we're, we're going to go through and sedate these animals anyway for vaccinations. So this gives the students an opportunity to, uh, to learn how to do that uh, properly under the supervision of veterinarians. And then, uh, you know, they learn how to monitor the animals that are under sedation and, and let them watch them recover. And then, uh, you know, then we'd return them back out into the pens. Uh, this year's certainly been a challenging year, but, uh, Fortunately, uh, we were able to get most of our classes and labs in. Um, you know, we had to follow some different protocols and do things a little bit differently, but uh, you know, fortunately we were able to get, get everything in this year. So no tour uh, in person or virtual would be uh, yeah, complete without uh, showing our, uh, our basically a, a pet deer that we have here that the, the students really uh, like to, to work around. This is uh, Peanut. Uh, she is a uh, six-year-old doe. When she was born, uh, she was only four pounds. Uh, a typical white-tailed deer weighs between uh, around seven pounds on average at birth. And her brothers were nine pounds and she was only four pounds. So when she was born, she couldn't even stand up. Uh, so we had to go in and, you know, bottle feed her and, and really take uh, care of her so that she survived. And uh, so now we basically have a, a deer that thinks it's a person. <laughs> and we, uh, we did breed her this year for the first time. Uh, I was just holding off for fear that she would not take care of her fawns because she wasn't taken care of by a, a deer when she was young. And uh, my fear was realized this summer when she had her, her little twin buck fawns and uh, you know, we found them all cuddled up by the feeder and she wasn't taking care of them. So we had to bottle feed them this summer. And uh, you know, if you have the opportunity to visit the facility in the future on a, a tour, uh, we do try to offer tours during Ag Progress Days uh, where we can bring the public in and, and, and go through the, the facility for a tour. But, uh, you know, if you get to visit the, the facility in the, the next few years, hopefully you'll, you'll have a chance to see her and, uh, and these little guys, maybe. Those are just some of the, the students that uh, we're working here in the summer and taking care of them. Uh, they need bottle fed uh, the first few days. We had to bottle feed about every 
two to three, four hours, uh, then it gets a little bit easier as they get a little bit older. So with that, uh, I think I'm gonna end my uh, show here. This is just a buck that we had a few years ago and uh, take some questions. All right, Don, we got a lot of questions submitted beforehand. You answered a good bit of them, but I'm gonna to try to get to as many as I possibly can. Uh, if you'd like to submit, um, if you would like to submit a question, you can use the Q&A tab here in Zoom. Um, let's talk about uh, just overall herd management. First of all, um, are white-tailed deer being properly managed uh, in Pennsylvania is a question we have coming in here. Okay, yeah. Uh, my, my job duties, I focus mainly on the, the captive facility. Uh, you know, I, most of all, all, almost all the research that I'm involved with is, is the animals that are right here at, at our facility. But, uh, but I'm certainly aware of the, you know, the captive or the, uh, the wild herd in Pennsylvania and, and how that's being managed. And, and, and the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, we have a, a team of uh, really good biologists in the, the game commission, uh, you know, and, and they, they do as good a job as they can. You're not gonna satisfy everybody out there. There's, there's hunters out there who want a deer behind every tree. Uh, you know, it's nice to see a lot of deer when you go out there. I hunt, I, you know, <laughs> right. I like to see deer as, as much as everybody else. Uh, but then you also have to realize that, you know, we have a lot of industries out there. You have the agriculture industry, uh, the hardwoods industry, uh, you know, just the safety of driving down the highway. Uh, everybody in the state, whether you hunt deer, whether you're an anti-hunter, it, it doesn't matter if you drive in Pennsylvania, right. what those deer biologists do affects how you, your commute. Uh, and, you know, it's, you know, from area to area, there may be differences that people don't like, but, uh, you know, on a, on a whole scale, uh, you know, I think they, they do a pretty good job of, right. of managing the herd. Well, you mentioned driving around the state of Pennsylvania. This might also be outside of the realm of your position, but maybe you have a resource you can point people towards. Um, do you uh, do you know of uh, any mapping of deer slash auto collisions in the state? Um, I've heard talks about adding wildlife bridges in Pennsylvania over heavily trafficked roads with lots of deer and curious if there's any data around where that might be most effective. So the question's dual about like uh, wildlife bridges and, and if so, if wildlife bridges are a good idea, uh, where would we put them, right? Is there data to help us put them in the right places? Uh, I don't get involved in any of that. Uh, I right. I, th I believe that, uh, and, and I think of the changes from time to time, I, I, sometimes it's hard to keep up with, but at, at times I believe the Game Commission has kept track of that. At times PennDOT has kept track of that. Uh, years ago, like back in the 1960s or 70s, I think they did some roadkill uh, work here at, at Penn State. But uh, yeah, I really don't know, uh, you know, what the situation is there. I, you know, I know those, the wildlife bridges are used in some areas, I believe Canada uh, uses them quite a bit. Uh, and, and, you know, they probably would work with deer. I mean, the, the big thing, you know, you would have to have a, a pretty substantial fence along the side of the road to get the deer kind of narrowed down into that area to go across. But, uh, right. you know, deer are very curious and, and uh, you know, I'm sure they would explore things like that. Uh, another question, a couple questions coming in around um, I, this is again more aimed towards uh, deer out in the wild, but recommended crops for a food plot. Uh, I get that question a lot, and, and it really depends on where yeah. you're at, uh, and and what time of year you want to bring those animals in. You know, are, are you a hunter that wants to harvest a deer over a, a food plot, or are you somebody who wants to go out and, and see that deer in a field in the summer? Uh, you know, watch the, the, right. the antlers grow through the year. Uh, and it also depends on what your neighbors have planted. Uh, you know, if, if the neighbor, if you're in an ag area and, and there's a whole field of clover over there, if you put a clover plot over here, it, it probably won't do a whole lot. So, you know, look at, look at what's in the surroundings. Uh, look at what crops uh, are palatable at the time of year you want the deer to be there. Uh, you know, a, a big thing is, uh, I mean, clover is something that you... A lot of times you can't go wrong with, 
but uh, you know, other things, uh, you know, if you want to provide cover for winter uh, or, or more nutrition in winter, you know, you might want to go with something more like winter wheat or turnips or, you know, things like that where the deer can dig up and, and root around in later. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty, pretty yeah. broad, broad area. Uh, someone's asking the question about um, are there things that are harmful, like hard corn? Yeah, so a lot of people uh, think it's a good idea, if, you know, you know, here in Pennsylvania, we just had, uh, where we're at, we just had 12 inches of snow, or well, 14 inches of snow last week. And, right. uh, you know, the, the animals are certainly nutritionally stressed over winter. And if you have an area where uh, you might have a mass crop failure and then a heavy snow, people think it's a good idea to just go out and dump a bunch of food out. But the problem is the way the, the, the rumen or the digestive system works in a deer, any type of a, a diet change should be implemented slowly. So for example, if we switch feed types here in our facility, we start feeding a little bit for a few days and then a little bit more, and then we just increase the percentage. So if we wanna switch a deer from one food to another one, we go over a 14 day period and it's done slowly. Uh, it takes a while for the, the microbes in the rumen to adapt to new food sources. So if a deer who has never been exposed to corn before comes up and just gorges himself on a, a pile of corn because it tastes really good and they're, they're starving, they don't necessarily have the microbes in their rumen to digest that. And it can actually produce toxins and, and actually make them sick and in some circumstances actually kill the animals. So any type of feeding, uh, and, and it's not recommended to feed wild deer. Uh, some places it's illegal to feed them but any, anything like that should be done gradually over a period of time and, and, and more of a sustained period of time. So um, how are deer selected for the research center? Uh, is it a, is it a self-perpetuating herd or do you bring in uh, from time to time deer from the outside into the research center? Yeah, so originally when the herd was, uh, you know, in the beginnings of the herd uh, and, and up until probably the mid 1990s, uh, actually, when I was here as a student, uh, we were able to bring deer in from wildlife rehabilitators. So, you know, if a deer was injured somewhere in the state uh, in the you know, vehicle collision or farming implement or something like that, um, it could go through a rehab center and come here. But because of all of the, the concerns with chronic wasting disease and, and other diseases, we are no longer able to bring deer into our facility. So, everything at our facility is born, you know, in, in the facility. Um, let's see here. There's some questions coming in around, um, around some region. So some region specific questions. So let me get to a couple of those. Having recently lived in a part of New Jersey where white-tailed deer seem to be as common as squirrels, one gets the impression that they are thriving in suburbia. Does climate change threaten this species in this region, or is this one where we don't have to be too concerned? So I guess the questions around climate change and um, and wild deer populations. Yeah, deer are are very adaptable. Uh, you know, and, and, and you look at at, at any of our cities, um, you know, particularly Philadelphia and, and, and Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania and, and many of the cities around New York or New Jersey. Right. Uh, we even have deer in you know in in New York City. Uh, they, they're easily adapted to suburban environments like that, uh, you know, particularly in areas where, you know, they, they're not hunted, they don't have natural predators, uh, they find food sources, you know, everybody plants flowers and landscaping, they, <laughs> until that's all gone. But, uh, you know, so, so from that perspective, the deer are adaptable and, and they can live among, you know, human populations pretty easily. Uh, to get to the, the climate change part, uh, you know, a couple interesting things there. There's a, a disease that you may hear pop up every once in a while. Uh, it's called uh, episodic hemorrhagic disease. And that particular disease is, is transmitted by uh, little midges that live along stream banks. Uh, and, and typically, uh, years that you see this uh, outbreak is, is when, whenever we have droughts. So the kind of the muddy scummy layer along the, the stream uh, is where these midges live and, and thrive. And then of course the deer come in to, to get water and uh, 
you know, or, or bitten, infected. Uh, this particular disease it was traditionally seen in the South. Uh, you know, when, when I started working here as a student, when I started managing the facility, we really didn't hear about it. And I think it was in uh, about 2007, uh, there was an outbreak down around uh, Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And then uh, more recent year, I think they had a smaller outbreak in 2012. And every once in a while it, it pops up. But that disease was something that was was always in the south. Uh, it was in the southern part of the country, and and there's some theories that uh, you know the warmer weather is is bringing the habitat, moving the habitat north for what you know where those midges can thrive, and uh, bringing the disease along with it. Uh, the disease has also hit the Midwest. Uh, some of the herds out there have just been devastated uh, in recent years, but uh, the deer will bounce back uh, from that particular disease. The the animals that survive an outbreak. Uh, you know, those are the genes that are passed on to the next generation. So the deer in the south, when they get hit with an EHD outbreak, a majority of them survive. The deer in the north that haven't been exposed to the disease yet, you'll lose a, a large percentage of those when, when that particular disease hits. Um, Bill and Larry are asking about the same question, so I'll, I'll share that with you. Uh, what are your facility's habitat management practices? Uh, how do you maintain the population of the deer herd uh, there? Does, the, does your captive herd ever get too large? Yeah, so uh, basically how we, we do that, number one, we control the, the breeding. So, you know, we might have 30 does here, but we may only breed 10 of them or, or eight of them. Or, you know, we, we try to control the, the, the fawn crop to a number that, that we're gonna be using for research projects and things like that. Uh, when we do have excess animals, uh, deer farming is a, a legal uh, business in Pennsylvania and industry. And so we are able to sell excess animals off to, to private deer farms. Uh, that actually you know, helps us pay for, for our fee bill uh, quite a bit each year. But uh, yeah, so we are able to control the, the population in, in those two ways. Um, you mentioned that you vaccinate the deer. What are you vaccinating them against? Uh, we vaccinate uh, against uh, several common livestock diseases. Uh, one is uh, Fusobacterium. Uh, and that in, in, wild, in uh, livestock, it typically, typically causes foot rot. But in white-tailed deer, it can also cause pneumonia. Uh, and also they get uh, some abscesses on their, their jaw, uh, along the side of their jaw and on and, uh, the tip of their nose. Uh, so we, we give that every year, uh, just because there's a lot of students working with the animals uh, on a routine basis, we, we vaccinate for rabies. Uh, deer can get rabies, it's pretty rare, but it, it has happened. Uh, there've been some documented cases down around the, the uh, southeastern part of the state in both wild and captive deer. Uh, Clostridium perfringens, uh, our Clostridium C and D is a vaccine we give. Uh, that's more of like a, an overeating disease, kind of like I was talking about with the corn, if they get into too much of something that they, right. they shouldn't have eaten. Uh, and then we also deworm them for common parasites uh, when we have our hands on them. Excellent. Uh, Terry is asking about, so Terry Katz uh, is asking, if an antler is broken back, um, back to the head, does, um, does that damaged tissue affect next year's antler's growth? Yes, if the, if the antler is growing and it's broke out, you know, part way out the antler, that only affects that year. If it's broke off down into the skull, uh, you know, sometimes you'll find a, a shed antler with a, a little jagged piece at the end that, that you can actually see as part of the skull, that will affect next year's antler growth. Uh, depending on how severe it is, uh, if it's really bad, it can affect antlers two, three, four years out. Uh, so you want a nice clean shed there. Uh, yeah, a question that I was thinking of related to antler, gro antler growth. You said it's um, it's a new set of antlers each year, um, but year over year, do the antlers get larger on that deer? So, um, uh, as the deer gets older, does the do the antlers uh, grow uh, to larger sizes? 
Yeah, I, I should have mentioned that. Uh, typically, they, they peak somewhere around anywhere between four to eight years old. Uh, but, but generally, you know, they'll grow their smallest set when they're a yearling, then two years old, three years old. They just they usually get a little bit bigger each year. Uh, it really depends on the individual animal when they peak, but it's, it's more of a mature animal. Uh, so that's why, you know, in, in certain states manage deer different ways. Uh, we have an antler restriction in Pennsylvania that protects our yearling deer. Uh, so most of those animals don't get harvested the first year. Most of them uh, will get to at least two or three years old, but those are, that's still not near the trophy category. Like you get states like Texas uh, and some of the private land there, they don't think right. about harvesting animals uh, younger than, than five or six years old. Great. Uh, you may not, this might be outside the realm of uh, things that you look at, but I'll, I'll throw it out there anyway. I thought some of the best pictures that you showed in your presentation were those of the other uh, wildlife that was going by that you were able to catch on camera, the, the bear and, and whatnot. But there's a question in here about um, fawn mortality rate, uh, the impact of coyotes on fawn mortality rate. Yeah, that, uh, and if you want the exact numbers, I should know that uh, it's been a number of years since they did the study. I think back in 2000, uh, they did the initial study in Pennsylvania, and then they, they did another study here recently. And, and I know the numbers matched when they, they redid the study, uh, but uh, I forget exactly what they were. But one, one of the interesting things they found was bears take just as many fawns uh, as what the coyotes do. It was, it was pretty much even. And that was something that wasn't really realized before that. Uh, but, uh, you know, the coyotes don't get all the fawns. Uh, the way the, the natural cycle goes with the, the fawns being born, most of those fawns are born in that short window between uh, the you know, end of May, beginning of June. And basically what that does is just dumps a whole lot of fawns on the ground at once. So coyotes and bears are overwhelmed. I mean, they, they can go through and take a lot of fawns, but there's still going to be a lot of survival uh, just because they can't go through and get every one that's there. Uh, if, if the fawning was spread out over a much broader period, uh, then, you know, it might be more of a concern. But, uh, you know, they do take some. It depends on, the you know, again, the individual area where you're at. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it doesn't typically decimate the, the herd. Um, Fred is asking, on occasion, I've seen a small fawn still with spots into the fall. Seems to be a late birth. How long do doe um, and estrus, uh, how long can a fawn be born and still survive in the wild? Uh, in the wild, it's tough, but I, I can tell you from my experience in captivity, uh, when, when we were working on the contraceptive trials, some of the drugs that we used uh, that didn't work as well uh, they would work early on this early on in the season, and then a doe will come into estrus every 24 to 28 days. So if she's not bred in November, she'll come back into estrus in December, January, February, March. We've we've documented those in our research herd uh, in estrus in March. So that would put fawns, you know, really late in the summer and early fall. So it, it's you know it can happen, uh, and and typically the animals that, that are late like that are born to fawns from the previous year. So those fawns, if a fawn is born in May, it's not ready to breed yet in November, but it might be ready in December or January. And so those fawns would be a little bit later. Uh, and, and, but if something happens where they don't breed till, you know, even, even later, January, February, or March, uh, then, then you would see fawns with the spots really late. Uh, and, and, and survival would just be a, a function of, uh, you know, how bad the winter is, how good the food is that year. Uh, you know, does the, does the doe, does its mother survive and, and able to nurse it? Uh, Great. So we have many more questions than we actually have time for today. So Don, I'm going to wrap up with, uh, wrap up with one question, one or two more questions. So uh, focusing more back on the facility, on the Deer Research Center. Mm -hmm. What's your greatest challenge today at the Research Center? Uh, I think, you know, the, the chronic wasting disease is, is something that, you know, we, we constantly have to keep our eye on and, and being prepared for. And, and uh, you know, the challenges related to that, you know, a lot of different regulations pop up, uh, you know, that may affect how we operate. 
Uh, so, you know, we just kind of have to, to be prepared and be flexible as, as that, uh, you know, disease gets closer. Great. And if anyone's looking for more information about the Deer Research Center, where can they find that? Uh, we do have a, a website on the uh, Department of Animal Science page here at Penn State. Uh, you know, it has uh, a little bit about the facility. Uh, certainly, you know, it was more covered in the tour today than what's on that site. But, uh, you know, my contact information's there. And, uh, you know, you feel free to reach out if, if uh, you, know, you have questions that, that you really want answered. <laughs> Excellent. And, well, Don, I'd like to thank you for joining us. And I also want to thank those who've tuned in today to the virtual speaker session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, as a reminder, we'll be hosting additional speaker sessions in the coming weeks and months. And this programming is in addition to a wide array of online networking events and career programs that are available throughout the year. You can find a full listing at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thanks again, Don, and we are Penn State. <laughs>